Hello. I have recently been doing some research on Tudor table etiquette, and I wanted to share with you what information I found so far. On the bottom left side of the screen, you will find a painting, and this gives you kind of an idea of what dining in the Tudor period would have looked like. On the far left, you can see the head table, and then you have everyone else not sitting at head table. But before we get into all of that, first, have you ever wondered where modern words and phrases came from? What I'm talking about, think of board meeting, chairman of the board, above board, board games, bed and board, born with a silver spoon in their mouth, potluck. I am sure you've heard one of these terms, probably many of these terms, but where did they come from? They have come from the Renaissance. So first, let's talk about etiquette. Here are two examples of dining in about the Middle Ages going into the Renaissance. And you can see on the left-hand side, there is the presentation of the peacock being presented to the diners. On the right-hand side, you can see the diners are also being presented with food. One thing to note on the right-hand side, it looks as if they are wearing napkins over their left shoulders. And this is one of many things we will get into. So what do you do before the meal? First, wash your hands. Well, even in modern times, that's probably a good thing to do because depending on what you were doing during the day, you were working in the farm fields or who knows how clean things were, it's probably a good idea to wash your hands. Another thing to do before the meal, undo your belt a little to be more comfortable since during the meal, well, it's bad manners to undo your belt. And even in today's society, I could see this being a thing. If you undid your belt beforehand discreetly, no one may notice you doing it. But if everyone's sitting at the table and you're partway through your meal and then you undo your belt, I'm specifically thinking of like a Thanksgiving meal. Probably a few people might be guilty of this, but it's considered bad manners, or at least historically speaking, it was considered bad manners to undo your belt in the middle of the meal. So you wanted to do this before the meal. That way you had enough room to be able to eat. When wiping your hands clean, keep good thoughts in your head. Otherwise, the dinner and others may become sad. I could see this rule becoming a thing just because if you, before the meal, you're washing your hands, you're wiping your hands clean, and you're keeping good thoughts in your head, then you're smiling, and like your shoulders are probably up and back, and you're proud, you're standing tall, you're smiling, you're happy, and you come in, you sit down, and then there's a pleasant air in the, in the room. But if you're thinking unpleasant thoughts, you're unhappy, you're sad, then your shoulders are probably slouched and slumped over and you're probably frowning or just sad, grumpy, whatever. And then that kind of puts a negative air into the, a negative feeling into the air. And then that can even think of today's society or today's world where someone comes to the table and they sit down and Specifically, I'm thinking like a grumpy teenager. You all sit down for your family meal and the grumpy teenager roughly pulls out their chair, slumps down in the chair, arms crossed. They're slouching, they're pouting, they're all grumpy. Well, that really doesn't make for a nice, pleasant meal when someone's unhappy. So when wiping your hands clean after you have washed your hands, make sure to have good thoughts in your head so that way you can come to the meal with a pleasant smile on your face and enjoy the meal with everyone else. And also remember to bring your own knife and spoon to the table. Spoons were a christening gift. Remember that one phrase I mentioned on the last page, born with a silver spoon in your mouth? That phrase actually comes from this period. And that's because it was a christening gift from your godparents. That's where you got your spoon. And you wanted to bring your own knife and spoon to the table because households at this time did not provide silverware for everyone at the table. Pretty much think of it as the modern equivalent to 
BYOB, bring your own beverage. With this, if you want to eat the food, you have to bring your own utensils. But one thing to keep in mind, if you notice, I mentioned knife and spoon, I did not mention fork. So stick a fork in that and we'll get back to that. So how are you supposed to act during the meal? First, you want to use a napkin to cover your lap or throw over your left shoulder, or you could also put it over your left wrist. In today's world, normally we put the napkin on our lap, unless you're eating barbecue or something, then you might tuck it into your shirt. But during the Renaissance, they would have tossed it over their left shoulder, or like I said, put it in their lap. And I'm specifically thinking the left shoulder just because most people are right-handed. And so if you have dirtied your right hand with something, it's a lot easier to reach on your left shoulder and wipe it off than trying to reach like this and wipe your right hand on your right shoulder. So it's a lot easier to reach over than up. The next thing, do not eat everything at the table. The servants, they need to eat too. So what would happen is after the food was prepared, it would be set on the table and you would have one section of food, like a big plate of something or a big bowl of something for probably four people in that area to use. If you think of it, think of like setting down food from a buffet, but instead of each person getting their individual plate going up to the buffet, the buffet is brought to them to the table. And so you set down a large plate of food every few people. And then you eat what you can, take what you want, but don't take all of the food because whatever is left on the plate, whatever is left in the bowl, then we'll go back to the kitchen and then the servants will eat the leftover food. Make sure to sit neatly and still. Do not shift side to side to release air. Even in the modern times, I think that's a good rule of thumb. You want to sit nice and neat and be able to enjoy your meal. You don't want to watch someone lean to the side, lift their butt cheek, and expel some smelly air. So, yeah, don't release air at the table. Good rule of thumb. Don't wipe your fingers on your clothes. Use the napkins or the board cloth, which would be the tablecloth. You'll notice that the word board keeps getting used, and that's because tables at this time were not like tables that we have today. Tables during this historic period, tables were set up like trestles. So you would have a board, a literal wooden board that would be set up by trestles or some legs that could go up onto the table to hold the board. But then when you were done, you remove the trestles, you remove the legs, and then everything can lay flat. It's compactable. That way you can move the table, well, the board and the trestles off to the side and then there was room in the room to do other things because at this time houses were not as big as what they are now and so space was very limited and that is why the boards were the trestles were removable from the boards they were collapsible you can move them off to the side and then make use of the room for other activities but because it was a board that was on top, then you have the board cloth, or that's also where we get other things like chairman of the board. That would be the person sitting at the head table. They were the, the chairperson at the board, or like this, the board cloth. That would be the tablecloth. It is the cloth that goes over the board. But back to the etiquette for this, don't wipe your fingers on your clothes. Well, even in today's world, that makes Pretty good sense because depending on what you're eating, like in today's world, if you're eating barbecue and you've got barbecue sauce all over your fingers and you're wearing a white shirt, or it could be spaghetti with spaghetti sauce and you're wearing a white shirt, the last thing you want to do is to wipe that mess on your clothes. Yes, in today's world, we have bleach and we have other cleaning products to try to clean the stains out, but why ruin your clothes if you don't have to? And that is for modern times. Historically speaking, they didn't have washing machines and bleach products to just simply try to remove a particular stain. 
fabric was very expensive. So yes, it makes sense to not wipe your dirty fingers on your clothes. Make your clothes last as long as possible. Cut bread with a knife. Don't tear it off into chunks. I think that also could be used in today's world. Um, if you think of any restaurant you go to where they serve bread, usually there is a knife included with that piece of bread and then you slice off your slice of bread. Yes, you could rip off a chunk, but if you rip off a chunk of bread, it's much more difficult to divide that bread evenly among the guests sitting at the table. So if you rip off a chunk and you're only needing to rip off a little bit, you might rip off a big chunk. It's also uneven. It lets off a lot of crumbs. So I think this rule of thumb for cutting your bread with a knife rather than ripping off a chunk just makes good sense. Do not overfill a spoon with super pottage and do not spill on the board cloth. Well, this to me just sounds like you're trying to be neat. You don't want to make a sloppy mess. You want to put enough soup in your bowl for you to enjoy, but don't fill it to the point where you're making a mess all over the board cloth, possibly spilling it on you. It, stay neat. Do not slurp your soup or pottage. Well, it was as good then as it is now. Imagine you're at a restaurant and you're especially a nice restaurant. Think of a nice restaurant. You've ordered a $50 steak and you're sitting there waiting for your appetizer to show up or you are already eating your nice steak. And then you hear the person at the table next to you going <laughs> as they're slurping up their soup. That might put a damper on your meal because you really don't want to hear that sound of someone else slurping their, their soup or their pottage. So it was as good then as it is now. So don't slurp your soup. Do not leave your soup in the communal dish when you are done. Remember how I said plates or bowls would come out and they would be set in between people, usually like groups of four at head table, depending on who the person was at head table. For example, the king had his own plate. The queen had her own plate. Others, a plate or a bowl would be set between two people, but everyone else not at head table, it was usually set in between four people and then four people would share from that same plate or from that bowl. So imagine you have a large bowl of soup or pottage. It's set in between four people. You take your spoon and you're scooping out the contents and putting it into your own individual bowl. Well, once you have scooped your contents into your bowl, now you are eating from your bowl. You do not want to put your spoon that has been in your mouth back into that communal bowl where everyone else might still be scooping out their contents and eating. It's just a way of not passing germs on from one person to another. Made sense then? And it definitely makes sense now, especially with the pandemic going on. Who wants to have a spoon that someone else has ate off of sitting in the bowl that you're about to scoop soup out of and eat from yourself? Let's not share those germs. Wipe your spoon clean with bread between servings of food. You could take the spoon and wipe it off on your napkin, the one that's on your shoulder or in your lap, but now you have stained your napkin. And do you really wanna stain your napkin if you don't have to? Especially when you have a piece of bread nearby, just take the spoon, wipe it off with the bread, and then, hey, you now have a little extra bit of soup on your bread that has flavored your bread, and now you can eat that little piece of bread. To me, it makes sense. Eat your food by dipping bread into it rather than using the spoon. This goes back to where you don't want saliva in the communal bowl. So before where I said you were using the, your own spoon in your bowl, I would say do that only if you are not putting your spoon back in the communal bowl. But otherwise, like if you have soup, you have bread, stick the bread in the soup, let it soak it up and then eat your bread that way. Oh, eat your soup that way with the bread. One thing I don't think I mentioned before about the napkins either being in your lap or over your shoulder, 
Napkins were typically made of linen, and I will include a link below where I did a little bit of research on 16th century napkins. In fact, I made two linen napkins that I put a little bit of black work embroidery on, on the corners to give to the king and queen of the kingdom that I live in, in the SCA. If you're curious about the SCA, that's the Society for Creative Anachronism. And I will include information about the Society for Creative Anachronism in the video description below. So we're still at the meal. Do not return chewed bones to the shared central plate. Well, yes, think of, well, just in modern times. You have taken a chicken leg, you have ate your chicken off the chicken leg. Would you like it if someone put their the remains of their bone back onto the plate that you're about to pick some other food up off of? Because remember, whatever is left on that plate is going back to the kitchen for the servants to eat. So to me, it makes good sense. Don't return your chewed bones onto the central plate that other people will be eating off of. If food is dropped on the floor, pick it up, but do not eat it. Okay, sounds simple enough. We're keeping things clean. Pick up your food that you dropped. Do not stuff your mouth, pick your teeth, make rude noises, scratch yourself, blow on your food, spit in the washing basin, spit up your food, talk with your mouth full, or fall asleep at the table. I added a whole lot of things into just this one bullet point. But to me, most of this, if not all of it, could be applied to today's world. Do not stuff your mouth. Don't pick your teeth, make rude noises. Well, think about that. If someone has stuffed their mouth so much that their cheeks are puffed out and they can't close their lips and then you're watching their food as they chew it, that's not a pleasant thing to look at. You really don't want to see someone sitting there picking their teeth while you are eating your food. You really don't want to hear rude noises, depending on what bodily noises they're making. Not the best thing to hear while you are trying to enjoy your food. So don't do it and make other people disgusted. Scratch yourself. I think this might depend on where, like, yeah, if I had a little itch on my finger, I could do this and I'm not going to offend anyone. If you had a scratch in your lower torso area, that might be a little offensive. So maybe just don't do that. Blow on your food. I know this is something that you can see in modern times, especially if you give food to a younger child. They may sit there like you have your soup. It's very hot, there's still steam rising, and you sit there and try to cool it off. But also thinking with modern times of the pandemic and stuff, you're blowing on your food, then you're blowing particles from your mouth at other people, and yeah, just don't blow on your food. Simple as that. Don't spit up your food or spit in the wash ba washing basin. Okay, that's simple enough. Don't talk with your mouth full. To me, this goes along with don't stuff your mouth because if you have all that food in your mouth and your mouth is moving and the lips aren't closed and people see the partly chewed food in your mouth, depend especially depending on what they are eating, it can just be gross. So don't talk with your mouth full. And don't fall asleep at the table. Depending on how long a meal could go, I could see where this could be considered rude, but meals sometimes could be long. And that's where you just do your best to sit upright and smile and engage in conversation and don't fall asleep. Also, do not put your elbows on the table. Well, that's a modern thing as well. It is impolite to put your elbows on the table. You also don't want to stroke the cats or the dogs at the table. Well, for most restaurants in modern times, that's also a thing where cats or dogs are either not allowed or they might be allowed if they're like, for example, an outdoor restaurant or you have a particular handicap where you need a service animal with you. 
but those service animals usually are trained to sit either beside you or underneath the table. But at that point, that service animal is working. And so you would not want to pet them anyways in modern times. And for historic purposes, I could see not wanting to scratch or the cats or the dogs at the table because if you're scratching them, then that means the dog is going to be more encouraged to be sitting there watching you eat. And depending on the breed of the dog, you can just imagine the drool coming out. They might be encouraged to try to sneak food off the, the board. Remember the board, the table. So just don't, don't stroke the cats or the dogs at the table. Simple enough. And food is picked up between the thumb and the first two fingers. For example, I have a pretzel stick. And as you can see, I am holding it between my thumb and the first two fingers. So you want to pick up your food like this and then eat. Think of being very dainty. You don't want to sit here and manhandle all of the food and have your ring finger and your pinky touching your food. I'm specifically thinking of this as applying towards meat. Imagine having a big chunk of meat. And if you are picking up with your thumb and your first two fingers, then you are eating daintily. You are not grabbing a big chunk and ripping it off. And it goes along with the same line of like, don't chew with your mouth full, don't talk with your mouth full. You want to pick up small bites and eat daintily. Okay. So what happens after the meal? Leftover food went to the servants, and if there was still food left over, then that went to the poor at the gates of the house. So remember, do not eat all of the food at the table because more than enough food has been prepared to feed not only those at the table, but also to feed the servants and hopefully the poor as well. And remember how I mentioned earlier about the tables were boards on trestles? The tables after the meal were dismantled and then stored until the next meal. And do you remember how I mentioned before about being born with a silver spoon in your mouth? And that was a gift from your godparents at your christening. On the right hand side is a silver spoon. This is from about 1577 to 1578, and this is in London. On the left hand side is a cutlery set. And this is from about 1550 to 1600, so the later half of the 16th century. And this cutlery set is French. One way how to immediately tell the French influence is the fork. Because the fork, to me, is synonymous with the, the De' Medici's. Because Catherine de' Medici, I know, helped bring the fork in and made it popular in France. And then after that, it slowly trickled into the surrounding European countries. Before that, you had your knife, you had your spoon, or also as you see in this picture, we have a knife, there's a fork, but then you also have a pick. So with this, with the pick, you would hold your meat with the pick, and then you would cut with the knife, and then you could eat with the pick, or you could eat with the fork. So now that we've talked about the etiquette of what to do before, during, and after the meal, so when do we eat? In the first half of the 16th century, meals were typically served twice a day, about 10 a.m. was dinner, and then 4 p.m. was supper. Unless you count breakfast, which literally is breaking your fast, so when you sleep during the night, you are fasting because you're sleeping, you are not eating, and then when you first wake up because you were fasting, you eat a little something first thing in the morning and there, that is when you are breaking your fast or having breakfast. And that was just usually something simple like bread and ale. However, by the 1580s, the dinner meal, that 10 a.m. meal, that dinner meal was served about noontime instead of 10 a.m. I think they like to sleep in a little bit at the royal court. Typically, there were two courses. The first course may have consisted of bread, boar meat, pork leg, venison, and whatever the in-season vegetables were. The second course may have consisted of roast lamb, rabbit, preserved fruit, gingerbread, and fish pie. One of the things to remember with the meals is that during the Renaissance, 
people were very religious. And with this, there were specific days where they were allowed or not allowed to eat foods, well, certain particular foods. For example, there was fasting on Wednesdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and also during Lent and Advent, they had to give up flesh foods. That means they could eat fish only, along with giving up other things such as butter, eggs, and dairy. What I mean by fish, fish, as you can see, I'm really <laughs> enhancing the quotation marks here, included veal, game, and poultry. So pretty much you were not allowed to eat cow or pig, but you could still have your chicken, for example. The elderly children and pregnant women were excused from fasting. So even though it says you were fasting on these days, you were just limited to what foods you were allowed to eat on these particular days. So how many dishes can we have? Do you know there were sumptuary laws that dictated exactly how many dishes a certain person was allowed to serve for their meal? The sumptuary law of May 31st, 1517 dictated the number of dishes per meal. For example, a cardinal could serve nine dishes, whereas dukes, marquesses, bishops, and earls could only serve seven dishes, and lower ranking lords were allowed six dishes. The gentry class, with an income of 40 to 100 pounds per year, were allowed to only serve three dishes per meal. Salt, which was very expensive at this time, was usually at the head table only. Remember how I described before about food being shared between people at a table? The food shared was referred to as a mess. The head table had a mess between two, except for the king and the queen who each had their own mess. Lower ranks, remember how I mentioned people at head table, so king gets his own, queen gets her own mess, everyone else at head table, there is a mess between every two people. And then everyone else not at head table, there is a mess shared between four people. The highest ranking person was allowed to dig into the food first. And then each person digs into the mess and puts their servings onto their own trencher, which a trencher was just a round of stale bread. White bread made from wheat was preferred by the wealthy. With this, think of the term upper crust. When the bread was baked, the bottom part might have been a little burnt. And so the higher up you were in society, you got the upper crust. And then the lower down in society you were, well, you got the lower crust. But they preferred their white bread. White bread at this time was synonymous with being wealthy. A side note, potluck was when a pottage, and a pottage was a stew mixed with vegetables, typically uh, root vegetables and spices, and had spare meat in it. So today's term for potluck usually just means you bring your thing, I'll bring my thing, and everyone brings something to the meal. So you for a potluck in today's world, you might have, you bring the hot dogs, you bring the hot dog buns, this person over here is bringing the baked beans, this person over here is bringing the potato chips, and every person brings something for the meal, and it's a potluck. Historically speaking, the potluck, pot, pottage, so the pot was from the pottage, and well, you were just depending on what went in there, you were lucky or unlucky for how the pottage would taste, how, much, how many spices. Specifically, you were lucky if any spare meat was available to go into the pottage. So if there was meat inside the pottage, then potluck, you were in luck, there was meat in the pottage, potluck. Here are some suggested courses from the book of a book of cookery from 1591. And on the left-hand side, you can see where it says the first course, and then it suggests pottage or stewed broth, boiled meat or stewed meat, chickens and bacon, powdered beef, pies, goose, pig, roasted beef, roasted veal, custard. And then for the second course, you could have roasted lamb, roasted capons, chickens. 
I don't know what pehenes are, baked venison and tart. Remember, depending on where you were in the hierarchy, then determined if you were allowed three or six or seven, you would have to check the sumptuary laws for your period to know exactly how many food items you were allowed to serve during your meal. Other examples on the bottom left side, there is another suggestion for the first course and second course for supper. On the right hand side is another suggestion from this book on the service for dinner, and it shows the first course and the second course. This book also includes suggestions for service for fish days, including which sauce to match with which fish. Here is another book, A Good Housewife's Handmaid from 1594. And this book also makes suggestions for the courses for your meals. On the left-hand side, there is a first course and a second course suggested. Then underneath that, there is another first course and a second course for supper. And then on the right-hand side is first course and second course for a dinner. This is also from A Good Housewife's Handmaid, and this is service for fish days, and it gives you suggestions for both the first course and the second course. Those words that were mentioned, such as board meeting, bed and board, chairman of the board, this is where this comes into play. As you can see on the left-hand side, there is a picture of a table. It is a board with trestles, so imagine legs underneath, and everything can be disassembled and then laid flat. And the same for the bench. The bench is assembled the same way that the board is. And a board meeting would be where everyone sat at the board and had a discussion. They could be, for example, if they were on a farm, they could be talking with the head of household about what happened on the farm today, what things need to be done, what has happened, things of that nature. So it would be a meeting at the board or a board meeting. Just the same, the head of the household would be the chairman of the board. Well, on the right-hand side is an example of what a Tudor household may have looked like for the dining area. And you can see it's sort of a U-shaped. And at the top, you'll have the head table, and that would be where the chairman board would sit, the head of the household and his wife. And if they had any guests of honor, they would sit at head table. And then perpendicular to head table is where everyone else not at head table would sit. And the term bed and board just comes from where if you had a guest spending the night, you would be offering bed and board. So you would be offering them food. They would be sitting at the board. Plus, you would also be offering them a place to sleep at night. So you would be offering them a bed and board. So bed and food. Remember the board games? Well, here are two examples. These are actually etched in stone, but what they would do a lot of times is on the board, you would have the top half of the board where you would eat. And then when you were done, the board cloth would be removed. The board could then be flipped over and that's where they had certain board games etched into the board. For example, these two, Examples are Nine Men's Morris, and that would have been just one of many games that could have been etched in on the underneath side of the board. If you have any questions, here is my Works Cited page. And here is my Works Cited page continued. If you would like to know, more about the historic board games that would have been etched in on the underneath side of the board. Please keep an eye out for a video on my channel. I'm also working on a video talking about and showing examples of different historic board games, as well as videos on explaining how to play some of those board games. For example, Albuquerque and chess. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please post your comments below. And if you like this video, please select thumbs up that you liked it. And as always, please subscribe to be updated when new videos come out.